Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Facebook is eating the world, wrote one of my guests today of the social media king that has cannibalized the information highway, making its medium the ultimate message. My other guest unleashed a tweet storm, a shorthand thesis paragraph, on the press's dilemma on which he expounds in a recent Washington Post column. If the population, or part of it, is in revolt against the political class, he writes, this is a problem for journalism. Now to introductions. Emily Bell is founding director of the Toe Center at Columbia School of Journalism. Bell is co-author of the forthcoming volume, Journalism After Snowden, The Future of the Free Press in the Surveillance State. And our other guest, Jay Rosen is chair emeritus and professor of journalism at the Arthur L. Carter Institute at New York University. Author of the Press Think blog, Rosen contends that Donald Trump is crashing the system and that journalists need to build a new one. And I want to ask them both if it's in this context, when vast amounts of information are pouring into social media, absent editorial discretion, that movements like Trumpism and Brexit are so possible today. And Jay, I thought we'd start with you because off the bus, your project dating back to the 2008 cycle was to empower citizen journalists are they still journalists or just citizens now in Facebook and Twitter and all these social media? Well, um, the First Amendment, uh, freedom of the press, uh, belongs to everyone. Uh, it really refers not to a profession or an industry, but everyone's right to publish and participate in public dialogue. So in that sense, everybody's part of the press. Uh, I define citizen journalism as uh, when the people formerly known as the audience use the media tools they have in their possession to inform one another, that's citizen journalism. Uh, journalists tend to see citizen journalism as amateurs taking over from professionals, which I don't think is necessarily what it's about. However, it certainly is true that the people formerly known as the audience, which is what I call them, have more power than they used to. Not just in the sense that they can publish themselves, they can uh, create their own videos, but they can reach each other in a way that they couldn't during the age of mass media. And they become a force in sharing things and thereby distributing them more widely. And also because their behavior, as for example, their shift to mobile devices, is something that the entire media industry has to really pay attention to and follow and respond to. So in many ways, the citizens, the audience, the people at home have a lot more power and the media is the one that has lost the power. Except maybe, Emily, for the Facebooks and the social media giants to the extent that, the again, the absence of editorial, and you've written about this, Jay, the absence of editorial guidelines is impacting this delivery mechanism. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so I think that Jay and I both started um, looking and, and working within this world, you know, uh, 15, 16, 17 years ago. Uh, and it was at a time when people talked about the open web, uh, opening up a sort of democratization of publishing. And as Jay's just described, that's absolutely true in terms of the tools 
But what we're seeing now is a reintermediation and a set of new gatekeepers of which Google, Facebook, um, Apple, you know, even Amazon are, these are vast companies and one of their very important functions, um, very important commercial functions, is to actually kind of provide a platform for content that's shared, distributed, created by, by, by um, everybody, by publishers, by citizens, by consumers. Um, and so maybe what we've actually done is traded one set of power dynamics for actually a much larger, more extensive uh, system of, of power, which actually we have much less insight into how it works. So you talk about the lack of kind of editorial guidelines. It, uh, there are definitely ways in which um, Facebook, for instance, sorts and presents uh, the content that we consume. Um, we largely don't know what they are because that's part of its um, commercial proposition as well. So, we, so we're in a we're in a really altered world. It's probably a very different one from the one that we thought we'd be in 15 or so years ago. And Jay, Facebook seems to have backpedaled from that news immersion in its sort of insistence on what's trending, dictating news value. Instead, they're stressing the personalization as being the pivotal influencer on how they sort through algorithmically, if you will. Um, but they're, you're, you're saying Facebook has moved from the view from nowhere. Mm. Ex and expound on that for our viewers. They've moved from saying that they're just an impartial carrier, if you will, yeah, of social technology. A little bit. Um, Facebook, Google, Apple uh, regard themselves as technology companies. They specifically don't want to be seen as editorial companies. And there's reasons for that. They don't want the responsibility. They don't want the expense of uh, editors and journalists. Uh, they don't want to have to say what their editorial approach is. They want to present themselves as platforms that carry everything or that are sort of neutral conveyances. Uh, and so for a long time, when journalists, editors asked Facebook about the algorithms that determine what people see, Facebook's answers were evasive in the extreme. They would say things like, uh, we don't control newsfeed, you control newsfeed. And um, we are trying not to make any editorial decisions. And um, the engineers who run Facebook probably believe this at some level, <laughs> that they were not introducing any selection criteria themselves. Recently, they've backed off that a little bit in that they put out this statement called Newsfeed Values which is a statement in some ways of priorities that they program into the newsfeed algorithm. And their first priority, which I think is, is very revealing, is friends and family come first. And what news of your social circle is always going to be uh, prior to news of the public world. And that's interesting because Facebook is in many ways, as Emily said, taking over the media, but not with the same priorities. Um, so we've begun the conversation about what Facebook's editorial profile or values are, uh, but there's a long way to go to get Facebook to take responsibility. For example, there's no editor-in-chief of Facebook, there's no ombudsman, there's no court of appeal, <laughs> there's no letters to the editor, there, there's really no way to engage in dialogue with Facebook about its editorial choices. Uh, and so we have a long way to go. What would a statement of value that is more meaningful to journalists and those observers of journalism, what would that look like? Well, I think that, um, as Jay said, lots of people have talked about it should have a public editor um, or it should start to kind of frame what it does in the, the way that we would think of an ethical code for, for journalists, which is what kind of material might you carry around certain incidents? You know, would you, do you think about protecting people who are um, uh, filmed live, uh, possibly in crisis, maybe at the point of death, you know, which we now see it really a tremendous amount of that type of footage um, appearing on platforms which would never have made it into the public domain through usual sort of broadcast um, standards. 
but at the same time, I think we need to be careful when we say, what would this look like for journalists? They're not, you know, they are editing the world. And I do think that they are editing the world, but now they're editing it for everybody. And, and we have to think about how the definition of publisher shifts under that as well, because I, there is no doubt in my mind that Facebook is a publisher. Even if Mark Zuckerberg is really definite, it's we're just a technology company because it sets so, it already sets actually lots of rules. So it does have, I mean, it has an enormous number of terms of use. You won't see much nudity on Facebook. You know, there are certain kind of rules around hate speech or around violence. Um, so they, they have these and they have them in a long and very sort of complex document. Uh, I think that in terms of when we talk about kind of editorially significant uh, codes, one of the things is really about this prioritization. So will we pick things that might break the rules, but because they are so important to the public interest, we will show them. Um, and that I think is where you get, ed you know, editors struggle with that every day, which is where does the public interest, where do we draw the lines around the public interest on this story? Um, and do we put things in the public domain that otherwise wouldn't be put in the public domain? Recorded conversations, you know, invasive photography, all sorts of things, if they, if we, if they can be shown to be in the public interest. And that actually is something where Facebook isn't necessarily developed in its, its thinking. Yeah, this, this has really made me think a lot about what an editorial company really is. And I think an editorial company as opposed to a technology company, a consumer products company, a manufacturing company, is really a different beast. And one of the things that's different about it is an editorial company is organized to understand that sometimes the editorial people have to do things that are against the interest of the company. And that's not a crisis, it's a normal fact of life. Whereas in a technology company, that is a problem. And so what's, what's disturbing, I think, for myself and Emily ab about Facebook is it's powerful enough to absorb the editorial business, but it's not willing to define itself as an editorial company. And, and that's why we criticize it. That's why we struggle with it. And I've talked to pe Facebook my people myself about this. And one of the things I tell them is that in the long run, you may find that your kind of business, a social network, which depends so much on the contributions coming from the users, requires thick rather than thin legitimacy. What I mean by that is thin legitimacy is where you kind of make a gesture like with terms of service, people check the box, they kind of know what they're agreeing to, but they really don't. It might hold up in court. There's some system there of, of, of legitimacy. They really don't understand what they're bargaining for. Thick legitimacy is when people know the deal, they know what Facebook's responsibilities are, they know what their rights are. Facebook tries to explain itself in the public sphere, it's held to certain values, it's accountable to certain values. And it may be that thick legitimacy is what's going to be required for that company to flourish in the future, but right now they're operating with thin legitimacy and they don't know how to get from one to the other. It is in the platform of Facebook where you can exploit malicious content. And you say, Jay, that there is a kind of false equivalency being granted to one set of partisans in this country in terms of the floodgates being open to that kind of mean-spirited rumor-mongering. Uh, you say that the spread of and dissemination of malicious rumors and unreliable information for which they, in this case the Trump campaign or Donald Trump himself, has no proof, that can be amplified in the absence of that thick legitimacy. Right. And Facebook certainly doesn't think it's any business Beyond of theirs. writing a letter Just, on, on behalf of tech moguls. But yeah, but the, we also have to be really clear that this is about cable television. This is about all sorts of things that play here, which are not just in Facebook's backyard. So one of the things that we have to be really careful about is, is saying that Facebook is a substantially worse position than we have been in the past. There's nothing to, you know, I don't believe in the golden age of journalism. I don't think there was a golden age of journalism which Facebook has overturned. You know, I come from the British market where journalists have gone to prison recently for uh, 
um, illegal invasions into people's privacy using kind of hacking technologies, etc. So you know, th there's a there's a, a danger in saying. Um, you know the Trump phenomenon is 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 created by filter bubbles, which are which are designed into social platforms because it's keeping your attention. That's it's all about the attention economy. But a lot of these are actually fed by, a, and Jay has written a huge amount about this about the lack of challenge that you get from perhaps you know traditional journalism. So you you have an interplay now between these wide and rapid dissemination systems where everything in the news is discussed largely among groups of people who are friends or a community already so they tend to be like-minded or familiar with each other's views um, and if you don't have a media which is kind of filtering for truth in other words they're pointing the camera at Trump and saying this is amazing entertainment we're getting off the scale ratings and then you have a reinforcement system in the forums that it's discussed in uh, and there's no kind of where is the you know, where is the intervention there? And I think that's one of the things where it's not just a Facebook problem. It's the interplay between of the course. two. And it's the bite-sized clips without context that are then made into the kind of propaganda videos that you see most virally exchanged. Facebook still, Emily Wright, according to your analysis and the work you do at Toe, is the powerhouse here in terms of the sheer volume yeah, fa Facebook, users. Facebook's numbers are really quite extraordinary when you think about it. They talk about having a universe of 1.6 billion users. Um, and then if you take into account that Facebook also owns WhatsApp, which is the messaging app, which is, is, is actually now closing in on a billion users. And it owns Instagram, which has, I, I don't know, five, six hundred million now. You know, th that's a that's a large amount of attention, not just in the States, but across the world that these platforms now contain, you know, and, and Google is a different beast, but it has YouTube and it has kind of, you know, the, it, it shapes the world of search. Um, and again, when we say the world uh, outside, you know, parts of kind of China and Southeast Asia, it pretty much is the world. Uh, and I think that, you know, kind of we haven't seen, I think lots of these problems are not new. But we haven't seen the speed and scale of dissemination and we haven't really kind of quite metabolized yet what that means in terms of an offline world and political action. And, and that, I think, is where it's not just that, you know, I don't think I, I think Facebook themselves are perplexed by that. You know, how do we deal with this new role in the world, which is creating kind of friction and conflict and it's certainly part of a much more rapid kind of uh, pattern of change in, in human behavior. Uh, and it's new for them and it, and it is new for the world. I don't think that, I think that we haven't seen this before. How do you see those analogs of the digital sphere intersecting with the groupthink of political reporters who create that Shakespearean uh, tension uh, in order to, to win an argument and sort of to win the day, as Politico says, right? Right. Well, one of the conclusions I've come to by studying the political press in the United States is that the image of the audience as out there, silent, inert, atomized from one another, and essentially consuming what the media brought them sinks much more deeply into people than I think they know. And political journalism in this country began to assume, unconsciously almost, that the public was really, for the most part, an inert audience. And a minority of people were interested in politics and how it actually worked. And one of the things they were interested in was the manipulation of that audience. And so political journalism became an invitation to us to join up with the insiders in understanding how the big audience could be pushed, pulled, moved, mobilized, demobilized. And that kind of invitation to look at politics the way the consultants do, the way the handlers do, the way the professionals who run it do, is really an invitation to um, to quit your solidarity with the public and to not be part of it at all, to be kind of on the side of the professionals, the people who run things. And 
what has happened recently is that a candidate, Donald Trump, came along, positioned the political class and journalists together in an elite that was, in his rhetoric, destroying the country. Which is why earlier in the campaign, his, uh, his pal Newt Gingrich said that a big part of the Trump campaign was going to be, if you support the media, vote for Clinton. If you hate the media, vote for Trump, right? So I think political journalism in the US lost its way a long time ago when it started to assume that the public was really an inert audience and that the people who were the uh, customers for political journalism wanted to be insiders. Is that a particularly dangerous proposition, though, when we talk about analytics? Isn't that a, a dangerous equation, the political? Well, when you have the insiderism of political journalism plus the commercially driven, uh, give them what they want mentality right. in the click-driven universe, it's a toxic combination, yeah. Emily? Well, yeah, but again, I don't think this is any, this, is, this really isn't different, right? So, so the language of um, ratings and attention and sales has always existed. And, we, you know, so, so to pretend that we at one time had a class of political coverage that was moderate, well-informed, um, very kind of, you know, measured uh, is probably not true you know kind of you go right back to yellow journalism and Joseph Pulitzer saying hey we have to make this stuff a bit more exciting you know we have to kind of go for things that will get people in the gut as well as make them think um, I do think though that again we, we it, it, it comes back to this issue of scale and we are designing new communication systems which are much more about sort of feeling than thought you know if you think about what keeps us engaged is something that makes us feel good or feel interested or feel angry you look at a facebook post and it has an option of lots of kind of reactions you know mm -hmm. we talk about how does you know trump makes us feel entertained engaged we feel that he's authentic because he picks off uh very personal things about his adversaries and he says the unsayable but the things that people are kind of thinking and then when he starts to talk about broader more complex topics that people don't have time in their daily lives to know to know in detail they think that guy speaks the truth but it's how they feel and i think that we have designed systems to hold our attention that are all about the, fe <laughs> the feelings and this is where something like facebook actually does have to my mind a civic responsibility to say is the way that we've designed this which is a totally serving a commercial mm. end actually now we are sort of civically influential Really, the do we have to rethink how we put this thing together? They don't want to do that. No, they don't. What do the analytics tell you about the digital literacy or illiteracy um, and, and how this is ultimately going to play out in November? We don't really have the analytics. So this is the other thing, which is that, you know, when you start to look around at where the baseline data comes from. There was a study that um, Facebook did uh, with its own data on filter bubbles in 2015, about a year ago. Uh, and it was an incredibly small sample and it was of people who were already indicated a political allegiance. There were all sorts of problems with it in terms of a social science sample. And it said, well, people are a little bit more likely to receive stuff that they are um, liking, you know, the, the, the sort of, but, but not really much more than um, is generally the case in media. But, but when you look at the kind of the trajectory of growth of something like Facebook, and then you look at the general availability of data to people like myself and Jay, who actually want to kind of conduct research or look at the numbers, it's really limited. I mean, it's, you know, kind of, we're, and we're very, so I think that we do tend to make these ass assertions. And when you say, how is this going to play out? I think one of the things that's very destabilizing is that people feel that they just don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's the instability of polls. I mean, I'm, a, I'm British. Uh, four or five days before the uh, Brexit poll, um, experts were pretty sure that uh, it would win by, you know, that, that we would st remain in the EU with a vote which was at least sort of 10 points clear. Completely untrue. <laughs> and, and so we just don't know. And I think people are becoming very 
self-conscious about how they express themselves and about how they allow their kind of views mm. to be known or shared, um, which sort of disrupts polling in a way as well. You know, Alexander, uh, this is, is not really responsive to your question, <laughs> but um, I've studied for a long time or tried to understand myself for a long time. What does it really take to have an informed public? What, what do we need for that to actually happen? And my first answer to that is, it takes a lot more than available information. And with journalists, what they have to do is really, it's kind of tricky. It's a delicate set of conditions. Because if all they do is say, this is the news that's important and you should know it, we're not necessarily gonna to listen to them because it's not gonna be meaningful, it's not gonna strike chords, it's, it's, not, it's not gonna be what our friends and family talk about, right? If on the other hand, the media simply registers our consumer preferences and gives us more of what we picked and clicked, then we're not gonna get the public world as part of that. So what we need is a press, a, a tribe of journalists who are very good at this delicate thing we, they listen well to people and they know what we want our news diet to be because they're well connected to us. And that generates for them certain trust or authority so that when they have to say to us, Emily, this is not your thing, but it's really important. You may not think this is interesting, but you should because we've checked it out and it is. That kind of relationship where you have enough trust that people kind of go with your recommendation is, is familiar to us from like friends. Like we have friends who are capable of being candid with us, friends who are capable of recommending something to us that we may not immediately cotton to. And that's the relationship that, that, that journalists really need with us. But there are so many things preventing that. There are so many ways in which that's not happening. Right. We talk about feeling gut versus brain. And I've been asking for days, months, years now if we're going to amuse our democracy back to life as opposed to to death. And that will be determined. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at OpenMindTV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Anne Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter Foundation. With special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support and to the corporate community, Mutual of America.